wonderful grace, what wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we turn again into the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. We've been looking the last couple of weeks at three great men in the Bible who had revelations given to them by God that were very special. We looked at the secret, Daniel's secret. Today we're going to look at Paul's mystery and then John's revelation. Those three men, Daniel, Paul, and John, were given special revelations by God to communicate some very special and important critical information. Daniel, is the, when he was called in before Nebuchadnezzar, he, he told Nebuchadnezzar, there's a, God in, the God, there's a God in heaven who reveals secrets to the sons of men. And he's going to tell you, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the last days. And what you find in the book of Daniel, actually the whole book, but especially Daniel chapter 2 where that statement takes place, is, is the, uh, the, the, the revelation of the details of the fulfilling of prophecy during the times of the Gentiles. When God takes the crown away from Israel. In fact, in, in Ezekiel chapter number 21, when, when God is talking, Ezekiel is, is a contemporary of Daniel. He's carried by, Babylon, by, by, by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylonian captivity also. And what God says to Israel through, through him, thus saith the Lord you know, God, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered and in that your transgressions are discovered, so that in all your doings your sins do appear. Thou profane, wicked prince of Israel whose day has come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem, take off the crown. That shall not be, uh, this shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low, abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. Talking about the Israel's position as the head of the nations. And it, the crown, shall not, shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Now that's a very important verse. God took away the crown, the right from the nation Israel to be the head of the nations in the earth because of their wickedness, their rebellion, their refusal to walk in his covenants and be the people he chose them to be. And he said, I'm going to take that crown away until he whose right it is comes and I'll give it to him. The one who's right it is. The rightful king of the universe is the Lord Jesus Christ. King Jesus is the right king of, of, of the whole universe. And when he comes back, he's going to get the crown. Now, that verse right there tells you something very interesting. I said to you when we were studying Daniel 2, that what Daniel, one of the things Daniel's system does, what, what, he, what he does is he fixes for you how to understand the prophetic scripture. What we call the premillennial dispensational system of Bible study is fixed for you by the secret revealed to Daniel about the, the times of the Gentiles, the Babylonians, the Media Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, all the way out to the Antichrist, the king of the north, king of the south. And then the stone cut without hands, picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back and destroying the Gentile world dominion. And then that growing up to a, a mountain into the kingdom of God that fills the whole earth. You see, the kingdom comes after, not before, Christ's coming. That's what we call it a pre millennial, a pre kingdom coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of this stuff of the post millennials and the, the amillennials. I have a friend, he says, an all-millennial is a post-millennialist without a post to lean on. And that, what that means is that ah, millennial, no kingdom, 
post. Christ comes after the kingdom. We just make everything better and better and better and better. We go out and reclaim the world and have the kingdom now and, and, the, and the dominion now kind of stuff. And we go out and reclaim the government, the power structure, and the economic structure, and the social structure. And things get good enough that Christ comes back. You say, that doesn't sound very smart. But that's the theological position of the great majority of so-called Christian schools, seminaries, and scholars. But that's not the position of the Bible. In the Bible, when you study the Bible dispensationally, you, fi you find that the Bible teaches a pre-millennial, a pre-kingdom established on the earth coming of Jesus Christ because the kingdom the crown of the, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the government of the earth, it rightfully belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. God has not and will not abandon his purpose with the nation Israel just because the nation Israel fails. And what you learn in the secret reveal of Daniel is that the goal of prophecy is God's intention to establish his authority, the, the authority of Jesus Christ over planet earth through the instrumentality of a kingdom that Jesus Christ will establish through the nation Israel. And that's the goal of the prophetic program. That's what Daniel, the secret Daniel is given about what's going to happen in the latter days, in the end of the times, when God establishes his purpose. We say the latter days it means it's like it's when, when, when what God's doing comes to fruition and the end is arrived at. It's not that there is no more time because the kingdom is eternal. It never ends. I think in Genesis chapter 17 when God told Abraham that he was going to give that land to Abraham and to his seed after him for an everlasting possession. All these folks run around and say, well, you know, in the book of Joshua, they got the land and it's over with. How long is everlasting? Just till the book of Joshua? Well, you know better than that. You know it's ever, if it's everlasting, it lasts forever. It's called eternal well, you see, that, that, that promise that God made was a statement of his intention. And what the book of Daniel does is it shows you the secret about how God's going to accomplish that. So Daniel's secret, the secret, Daniel's secret gives us the goal of prophecy. The kingdom of Christ established in the earth. The mystery revealed to Paul talks not about the prophetic program, but something that's not in the prophetic program. Acts 3.21, Peter is still talking about prophecy. He says that the things that we're talking to you about here in the book of Acts, early part of Acts, is that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. They're continuing to see the fulfilling of what Daniel had promised. When you come to the Apostle Paul, Paul says God's interrupted the prophetic program and that what God's doing now is not that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. But Romans 16 and 25, he says what he's doing now is that which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 25. Colossians chapter number 1. Verse uh, 25, the Apostle Paul describes his ministry this way. Whereof I made a minister, talking about the church, the body of Christ. Whereof I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery. Here's the dispensation that's given to Paul. The mystery, the secret Listen carefully, which, in, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. You see, there's some information that God hid from Daniel. He made Daniel to understand, gave Daniel some revelation, some secret information about the prophetic program, but there was some other information he never told Daniel about. Didn't tell, tell Joel about it. Didn't tell Daniel, David about it. Didn't tell Abraham about it. Nobody. He kept it hid. If you look in Ephesians chapter 3, you get, you get an idea about how he did this. Ephesians 3 verse 2. Paul said, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. So like what he said in Colossians. How that by revelation he made known unto me, the mystery. Just like there's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets to Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, 
So the same God in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, reveals some information to the Apostle Paul, some information that was previously hidden. Verse 9, he says, His purpose is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid, listen, in God. Not just hidden in the Scripture. You remember Luke chapter 18, Jesus takes his apostles aside, the twelve, and he tells them it's time for me to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be spit upon, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be beaten, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. Just like the scripture said I would. And then Luke 18 verse 34 says they understood none of these things. Neither knew what, what, he, what he said, and these things were hidden from them. Now, there were some things right there that he says, I'm going to go fulfill everything written in the Scripture, and yet those things were hidden from the apostles. Later on, after the resurrection, Luke 24, he opens their eyes they might, that they might see in the Scripture how that he must need suffer and rise again. And he showed them that in the law and the prophets and the writings. So the fact that Jesus Christ is going to die and be raised again is in the Old Testament Scripture, but it was hidden. It wasn't clearly, it wasn't something that people, when they studied it, said, oh, that's the Messiah dying. They, these guys who knew the Scripture from the time they were, you know, knee-high to a gnat, they, they just come right up learning Scripture as Jewish young boys, and yet it was hid from them. But it was in the Scripture, Hidden in the, that's not what we're reading here in, Luke, in Ephesians 3, 11, 3, 9 rather. And the reason he says it like he does, he says, this mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid, not in the scripture, but hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, by the way. Now, for something to be hid in, God knew it, but he never laid it out anywhere for anybody else to get it. Now, that information that was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, was made manifest through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. It's the revelation that Christ made known unto me, the mystery. It's the information that Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul. And Colossians 1.27 tells you what it's about. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, you Gentiles, the hope of glory. You see, he doesn't just want you to know that there's something new revealed through Paul. You've got to know that to know what it is. But he wants you to understand the riches of the glory of what God's doing today. So the mystery... Daniel's secret had to do with the goal of prophecy. Paul's mystery has to do with the riches of the glory of what God's doing today. And what's that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Think about it this way. In time past with the nation Israel, God, Jehovah God, and that will be Jehovah God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, before he took on our flesh, dwelt among Israel. First, he gave them a, a tabernacle, a house made out of skins that Moses built. And he said, you go in in that Holy of Holies, you have the outer court, the holy place, and the Holy of Holies, and I'm going to manifest my glory in the, holiest of, uh, the Holy of Holies. You've heard of the Shekinah glory of God. The word Shekinah, that's a Hebrew word, put over it in, in English, and that word Shekinah means the presence. God manifested his presence in the nation Israel. He dwelt among them. They are called the house of Israel. A house is somewhere you live. Later God, God gave them, they moved from the tabernacle to the temple, a more permanent dwelling place in the land. When they inherited the land and had a permanent place, then they had the place of the temple there on the mount. And God dwelt in their midst, in that holy of holies, above the mercy seat. He dwelt there. And he manifested his presence there. And if you want, you remember Daniel, the reason he got thrown into the lion's den, was that three times a day he looked toward Jerusalem and he prayed 
Why did he pray toward Jerusalem? He prayed toward Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of religions, by the way, that come along and try to plagiarize that and have, have their religious followers pray toward their shrines. But the reason God had Daniel, Daniel did that is because that's where God's dwelling. That's where God's throne was to be in the earth. That's why when God was educating Moses in Exodus 3 about his calling to, to deliver Israel, he said, take off your, your shoes because the ground, you're standing on holy ground. Now, he didn't tell him to take off his shoes and expose his bare, dirty flesh feet in the presence of a holy God. The seraphim in Isaiah chapter number 6, they take their wings and they cover their feet. Why? Because they're in the presence of a thrice holy God. Well, that is the idea with Exodus. In Exodus, if it's because you're in the presence of God, you'd cover your feet. You wouldn't take your shoes off. The reason that Moses was told to take his shoes off is because the ground was holy. There was, he was teaching Moses about the purpose that he had set apart that land for, and Moses had missed it. And by the way, in the Bible, taking your shoes off is a sign of rebuke for not doing, not walking in the path that you should walk in. But that's something else. We'll have to talk about that at another time. My point to you is that God's presence in the earth within the nation of Israel, Israel was his manifest, the place he manifests his presence and his glory. And if a Gentile wanted to come to the God of, the God of creation, they had to come to that temple and that tabernacle that belonged to Israel. And they had to come through Israel to get to God. The riches of the glory of the mystery revealed through Paul is that now God is forming a new agency. He's dealing with mankind in a different way. That today through the fall of Israel, Romans 11, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Today God has set the nation Israel aside. In fact, Romans 11 says that they are enemies for our sake. You say, whoa, for the Father's sake, their beloved, the gifts of calling a God without repentance. God is not through with Israel. God will accomplish his purpose and his plan and his prophetic statements and his promises to Israel. But today, there's no advantage before God to be a Jew or, 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 or for that matter, to be a Gentile. It's through the fall of Israel, not the rise to kingdom glory and promise, but not the rise that Daniel says we're going to have, but through the setting aside of, of Israel from that favored position down to being just like any other lost sinner. Don't you love that verse in Romans where it says, there's no difference for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. No difference between Jew or Gentile. It doesn't do you any good to be a Jew. It doesn't disadvantage you at all today to be a Gentile. Because we're all sinners and God just deals with us as sinners. You see, Paul says that uh, it's a worthy, it's a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. How be it for this cause to be the chief of sinners, to be the leader of sinners? How be it for this cause Jesus Christ showed forth in me? All long suffering for a pattern which to them, to them which should hereafter have to believe on him to life everlasting. You see, God did something with Paul, and Paul was the first in a line of people that were going to follow him that God did something. He showed forth his long suffering, not his wrath, not his rejection, not his angry face, but his long suffering and his grace. And he takes Jew and Gentile bonder free. And he says, there's no difference for the same Lord over all is rich unto all. For whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. Today there's no difference between a Jew or a Gentile. We're all sinners. And there's no difference between the Jew or Gentile because any one of us can come and trust Christ and be accepted into the family of God and placed into a spiritual unit of believers called the church, the body of Christ in which there is no Jewish status or Gentile status. When you get saved today, you don't become a spiritual Jew. How silly is that? You say, yeah, but brother, don't, don't, let's don't do the yeah, but stuff. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says it very clearly. 
Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you haven't grown up enough to know, let me tell you, that's got nothing to do with water baptism. I understand a lot of people, every time they see that word baptized, they go, water! They can't help themselves. I understand that. But if you would just for a moment lay aside all of your tradition and everything everybody ever told you, and just read that verse. In fact, go get you a King James Bible and read it yourself. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ. How can you possibly be baptized into Christ? Think about that. That can't be physical. Number one, he's not here physically. Number two, when he was, it was 2,000 years ago. Add to that Romans 6, 3, don't you know as many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? It didn't say you're baptized into water. It says you're baptized into Christ, into his death. You're buried with him by baptism into death. None of that can be physical. You know that. You know all of that has to be the only way it can be real is for it to be spiritual. Now, you can spiritualize it and say it's not real. It's symbolic. means something doesn't mean. But if it's real, see, something can be real and not be physical. It can be spirit, a spiritual reality. And the way you get baptized into Christ is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Where there's no Jew or Gentile. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all, Jew or Gentile, baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been, made, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. You see, when you get saved today, you're put into the body of Christ, and there's no, no special status, Jew-Gentile status. We're just all one on an equal basis. That's what he says here, Galatians 3.27. As many of you have been baptized into Christ, how did you get baptized into Christ? The Spirit of God baptized you into the body of Christ. Have put, you've put on Christ. There, in Christ, is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, you know he's not talking about physical. Physically, there's no Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, because you know physically there are male and female people today that are saved. Well, where is it that you lose your identity, your physical identity? In Christ, in the body of Christ. Well, if you've lost that, that, that identity in the body of Christ... How could you be put into the body of Christ where there's no status of being a Jew or a Gentile and be made a spiritual Jew? Now this is not rocket science. This is just thinking about what the verse says. You say, well, if I'm not a Jew or a Gentile, what am I? You're a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He says, we're one new man. You literally are become, have become a part of a new species of humanity called the church, the body of Christ. You're in that spiritual body of believers in which there's no Jew or Gentile. There's absolute, total equality. God is as rich to you in Christ as he is to me, as he is to anyone else. We've all been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We're all complete in him. For all of us, God has freely given us all things in his son. That's wonderful. Total, complete equality in Christ. And Paul says, I want you to see what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. The mystery is not Christ in you, the hope of glory. The, the riches or the glory of it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God doesn't just want you to see that something different was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. He wants you to see what it is, and he wants you to see how wealthy it's made you. 
Don't stop along the way of life to try to be someone God hasn't made you. Get in your Bible. Rightly divide it. Make the distinction God has made between Israel and the body of Christ. Understand you are the church, the body of Christ today, and in Him you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You've been made a part of a new creature that God is forming today to use you in eternity future. Do you understand that each day of your life now counts for eternity? I talk to people and they say, Brother Rick, I'm just trying to get through today. Oh, my friend, you're living for eternity. Get your chin off your chest. Quit thinking it's all about you and only about now and think and realize it's really about Him and about His eternal glory that He's going to gain through you and me as He uses us as trophies to the, the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. That's what God's doing today. That's the, the riches of the glory. Paul's mystery is about the riches of the glory that God is gaining for himself through Jesus Christ today as he takes Jews and Gentile, bond and free, whoever you might be, religious, non-religious, good, bad, indifferent, big, little, medium size, whoever you are, and you just trust his son and him exclusively as your savior. Then God puts you in Christ, blesses you with all spiritual blessings and heaven, blessings in heavenly places, and uses every moment of your life now for eternity. Wow. That's the rich, that's how wealthy you are in Christ. Don't let someone steal that from you. Till next time, there nothing. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have an audio CD we would like you to have to go along with today's study. It's yours free of charge. It's our way of saying thank you for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal. If you simply write us here at The Message of Grace, the address should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you may also call us at regular business hours, toll free, 888-535-2300. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If our study together has been a help to you, we would be happy to put you in touch with a Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided Word. And friend, if you are still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. That address again is The Message of Grace, P.O. Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace. He took the blame.